Well, it's Palm Sunday today as we get ready and anticipate celebrating Easter a week from today. And Palm Sunday is that, is that day where Jesus entered Jerusalem. And he's entering the last week of his life and entering into give his life for not just for the people of that time period but for people of all time periods and what's interesting about Jesus doing this is the way he did it and the message that he was sending to the people of that time period was he was writing in as a, as a king as the king as the long awaited king as the one who was promised to, to King David to sit on his throne forever and last week we we looked at the, the promise that God made to King David. He said, hey, because King David wanted to build a temple for God. And God said, no, I don't want you to build a temple. Your son will build a temple. But here's what I'm going to promise you. I'll promise that, that one of your descendants will sit on your throne forever. And that Palm Sunday when Jesus rode in, he rode in on a donkey. And that was very significant because when Solomon, David's son, was made king, because Solomon was not technically next in line to be the king. He was not the oldest of David's sons. But that's who God had wanted to be king. And one of David's other sons, his oldest son, tried to take the, the throne. David heard about this and they, he said, no, this is what you need to do. Go take Solomon, go anoint him, go put him on my donkey and ride him through and announce that he is the king. And so that everyone, everybody saw Solomon riding on David's donkey. They knew this is David's choice. This is the next king of Israel, not Adonijah. And so when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, people knew exactly what Jesus was doing. There was a time where Jesus was going to go with his brother. One of his brothers would say, hey, why don't you go into to the festival? There's a feast going on, one of the many feasts of Israel. He said, why don't you go in? Why don't you go in and... Announce who you are. Announce publicly who you are. And Jesus said, no, that's not my time to do that. Jesus went to the festival anyway, but he went in secret. But his brother, what his brother wanted him to do is go publicly. Now, his brother didn't want him to do that because he believed in him. His brother was just like, yeah, if you say, if you think you're so big and so bad, and this, you know, king of kings, why don't you go? His brother didn't believe him at the time. But Jesus, at this time, it was his time to ride in publicly declaring, yes, I am the son of David. I am the long-awaited one. I am the long-awaited promised one that God promised to David so long ago. What's interesting about David's kingdom, and as we've been going through this series called Promises, we've been looking at the different promises God made to his people. And last week, like I said, we looked at the promises God made to David. But David's kingdom didn't last forever. When Solomon became king, Solomon did a pretty good job for a while, but then the kingdom started to fall apart because the thing that the one thing that's synonymous with Solomon is wisdom. Because that's what Solomon asked for. He said, I need wisdom, God. If I'm going to lead your people, I'm going to need wisdom. And God told him, like, you can ask for anything you want, and that's what Solomon asked for. And God honored that, and he said, because you asked for wisdom, I'm going to give you all this other stuff too. Because you weren't trying to make a name for yourself, you're trying to make a name for for me, for God. Solomon did a pretty good job, but then he lost sight of where that wisdom came from. He started using that wisdom for his own gain rather than to glorify God. And the kingdom fell apart soon after Solomon passed away. The kingdom was left to his son Rehoboam, and Rehoboam was not a good king, and the kingdom split apart, and eventually the kingdom crumbled. But God, God was ever faithful. God remained faithful to the promises that he made to David. Even despite the fact that the kingdom fell apart and the kingdom of Israel eventually was taken into exile and destroyed, God always left a remnant of David's line. Even God showed his unending faithfulness not only to his people, but even to the Gentiles as well, the non-Jewish people. And God, in the midst of all this exile, and this destruction, he promised a new covenant. He promised a covenant that would be better than the old one. God said in Amos chapter 9, verse 11 through 12, In that day I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen and repair its breaches, 
and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name. Amos was a prophet during this time of exile, or even maybe a little bit before exile. But he's one of those minor prophets, and God spoke to him, spoke through him, and says, I got it. This is my promise to my people. I will restore David's tent. I will restore it. When Jesus entered this world, he brought with him this new covenant. When Jesus rode in Jerusalem, what he is doing is he's announcing that the new covenant was here. But this new covenant, what's interesting about it is we call it the new covenant, but this was not necessarily new. This new covenant was actually rooted in the great story of God that is found even in the Old Testament. Because we always have to keep in mind, because I think sometimes I do this, when I'm reading the Gospels, I'm reading the New Testament, I'm, I'm reading this as though this was written down in the first century when Jesus was actually living. It wasn't. Those weren't the scriptures yet because they hadn't been written down yet. When Jesus wrote in Jerusalem, what were the scriptures? The Old Testament. What we call the Old Testament, that was their Bible. That was their scriptures. Genesis all the way through Malachi. That's what they read. That's what was read to them. That's what they heard. And so when Jesus was writing in to usher in a new covenant, this new covenant was deeply rooted in the story of scripture. Stories found from Genesis to Malachi. So that's what we're going to look at today. If you want to follow along, I have sermon notes on, if you go to ser.vi on your smartphones and just type in Chelmsford Bible Church, you'll find interactive sermon notes. The first thing we'll look at is that this old was made new. The old is made new. And we're going to be in Ezekiel chapter 36. Like I said, you know, we, 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 you think, oh, we're talking about new covenants, we're going to go into the gospel. We will look at some of the gospel stuff, we will look in the New Testament, but I wanted you to see how this was rooted in the old. And when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday, he was, he was announcing something that was deeply rooted in their scriptures and that these people should know about. So Ezekiel chapter 36, Ezekiel prophesized during a time, see Babylonian, he prophesied during a time of Babylonian exile. Babylonian exile actually kind of took part in two, two parts, two phases. The first phase was the, the Nebuchadnezzar came in and, and took out the royalty, and that's where you get like Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're kind of the, the royal, royalty of Israel, the elite of Israel. And then Babylon told Jerusalem, told Judah, hey, just listen to us, do what we say, and we'll leave you alone. Even some of the prophets of God told the kingdom, king of Judah, hey, <clears throat> submit to Babylon, listen to them. Don't do anything stupid. Don't do anything dumb. And do the, does the king listen to the prophets? Of course not. They got to go try to align themselves with Egypt and say, you know what? Let's partner with Egypt and we'll fight Babylon because Egypt hates Babylon too. And they will... Egypt will come to our rescue. Does Egypt show up? Nope, they don't. And Nebuchadnezzar says, I told you to listen. And then he destroyed Jerusalem. So that's the context that Ezekiel is prophesying in, in this kind of two-phase exile into Babylon. But in Ezekiel 36, starting in verse 25, this is what God says to the prophet. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness. Let me switch my translation to NIV so you can follow along better. I will cleanse you from all your impurities, from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people and I will be your God. I will save you from all your unclean, uncleanness. I will call for the grain and make it plentiful and will not bring famine upon you. I will increase the fruit of the trees and the crops of the fields so that you will no longer suffer disgrace among the nations because of famine. Then you will remember your evil ways and wicked deeds and you will loathe yourselves for your sins and detestable practices. I want you to know that I'm not doing this for your sake, declares the sovereign Lord. Be ashamed of disgrace for your conduct, people of Israel. 
This is what the sovereign Lord says. On the day I cleanse you from all your sins, I will resettle your towns and the ruins will be rebuilt. The desolate land will be cultivated instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass through it. They will say this land that was laid waste has become like the Garden of Eden. The cities that were lying in ruins, desolate and destroyed, are now fortified and inhabited. Then the nations around you that remain will know that, the, that I, the Lord, have rebuilt what was destroyed and have replanted what was de desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken and I will do it. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Once again, I will yield to Israel's plea and do this for them. I will make their people as numerous as sheep, as numerous as the flocks for offerings at Jerusalem during her appointed festivals. So will the ruined cities be filled with flocks of people. Then they will know that I am the Lord. So I, I really enjoy a good story. I really enjoy like how somebody can tell a story, whether it's, whether it's a TV series, whether it's a book. I love a good story where they just keep adding and keep adding. They start with like a small little piece and then add, 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 add. And then it builds to this big climax, this crescendo, like a, like a great orchestra, you know, a great orchestra that knows it's timing well and can, and can time that, that piece that they're playing. And it starts off maybe quiet and it builds, 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 builds into this great crescendo. And it stirs up all those emotions inside you. That crescendo, the, the crescendo sounds rushed and the audience can be taken off guard rather than waiting in like this eager anticipation for the great crescendo they know is coming. So the Old Testament builds up to this great crescendo. And the great crescendo is Jesus. See, the stories of the Old Testament, they take their time. They take their time in preparing God's people for what's coming. God's people had turned away. They had worshipped idols. They had oppressed their own. The rich kept getting richer and the poor kept getting poorer and the rich kept stepping on him, stopping on him, keeping him down. They had turned away from what God was really wanting them to do, to be a royal priesthood, to be that holy nation, to declare the excellencies of God wherever they went to other nations around them. They had lost sight of all of that and God was left no choice because he kept sending prophet after prophet after prophet. Even Jesus, when he was doing his thing, when he was preaching, he told the people of Israel, he told them a story about a story of a vineyard, a vineyard owner. And the vineyard owner kept sending worker after worker after worker, servant after servant after servant. And the workers just looked at them, ignored them, killed them, slaughtered them, kicked them out. And then the owner of the vineyard said, I'll send my son that surely will listen to my son. And they killed the son too. God had sent prophet after prophet after prophet to the people of Israel. The prophets kept declaring to them, hey, you are going down a path that will lead to destruction. God is going to send nations against you. You need to turn back to God. And they just kept ignoring it. After the fall of the kingdom of Israel, the Israelites were taken into captivity into the land of Assyria and Babylon. And that's where Ezekiel comes in and he's prophesying to the southern kingdom of Judah who was taken into Babylon. But the thing about Ezekiel, he was not all doom and gloom. And this passage that we just read speaks of that great redemption that God is promising. And you're going to see some of that fulfillment immediately. You know, they'll be, they'll be in exile for about 70 years. The Persian kingdom will take over. And the Persian king will allow the Jews to go back and rebuild what was destroyed. But that's not the main focus of that. Because a lot of times prophecies have immediate fulfillment and they have long-term fulfillment that will come in the future. And the more important fulfillment in this prophecy that Ezekiel speaks is Jesus. Because notice how God said he would sprinkle clean water on them first. He would cleanse them. He would get them ready to be changed. Then he would give them a new heart. He would take out their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Isn't it great when you go to like some, somewhere like tropical or you find some kind of very clear lake or something, you go swim in that, as opposed to finding like some muddy pond somewhere? You know, it's a huge difference. You go swimming in a muddy pond or a muddy river or a muddy lake, you walk out and you think, I have every 
piece of mud, grime, and I'm pretty sure I might have some leeches all over me. Anybody ever seen the movie Stand By Me? Remember Stand By Me? They go jump, they go jump into that dirty pond and they, they come out, they think they're having a good time, and they walk out and they just go, leeches, because there's leeches all over them. But you go and swim in like a clear lake, a clear pond. I don't know if there's such things as clear ponds, more like lakes. Clear lakes, rivers, oceans. It's a totally different story. You almost feel like you just took a shower. Very clean water. So God tells his people, I'm going to sprinkle clean water on you. Because his people have been swimming in the dirty ponds and dirty oceans and dirty lakes and streams and rivers and wherever they can find. It's all dirty. God said, you got to stop swimming in those. I got better water for you. I'm going to clean you, cleanse you with. And he said, I'm not, then, then after that's done, I'm going to take your heart of stone. Because here's what happens to our hearts. When we turn away from God, our hearts get hard. We become bitter. We become angry. We begin to hate things. Hate people. Hate God. And that's what the Israelites had done. They turned away from God. The source of their life and their hearts had become stone. And so God says, I'm going to take those hearts of stone. I'm going to, I'm going to destroy those hearts of stone. And I'm going to replace those hearts of stone with a heart of flesh. See, the Israelites have become like the stone idols they had worshipped. We become like what we worship. Whatever we worship, that's what we're going to look like. That's what we're going to act like. That's what we're going to think like. When Jesus had that famous encounter with Nicodemus, Jesus was explaining why he was there. And Nicodemus was having a tough time understanding why Jesus was there. He's like, this doesn't... It doesn't make sense. Like, what are, you, what are you talking about? So if you go to John chapter 3, I want to read some of this interaction that Jesus has with Nicodemus. And many of us may know John 3, 16. Probably most fam one of the most famous verses in all of Scripture. But it's important to understand the context that that is found in. So in John chapter 3, verse, starting in verse 3, it says this. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And so this, when Jesus said that, you know, he's, he's trying to link this to Ezekiel. That's where, that, that passage we just read in Ezekiel is all about being born again because God says, I'm going to take out that heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And if you, if you have time, read Ezekiel 37 with the Valley of Dry Bones. Because Ezekiel's looking at his Valley of Dry Bones, like, what am I going to do with this? And God says, speak to those dry bones. And when you speak to those dry bones, they're going to come alive. Verse 4, how can someone be born when they are old? So Nicodemus is not understanding this. Surely they cannot enter a second time to their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Again, linking with Ezekiel, what did God say? I'm going to sprinkle clean water on you. Then I'm going to take that heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And then you look at Ezekiel 37 with the Valley of Dry Bones. Ezekiel speaks those dry bones. Those bones begin to rattle and shake. They begin to come together. Flesh goes over those bones, but they're not alive yet. And then God says to Ezekiel, speak again, breathe. Breathe on those dry bones. Breathe the very word of God. You know, the same Hebrew word for spirit referring to the Holy Spirit is the same Hebrew word for wind. Verse 5, John 3. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. He is dumbfounded. And let me tell you something about Nicodemus. He is one of the elite teachers of Israel. He is supposed to be the expert in the law of God, the word of God, and he's not getting it. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? It's almost like Jesus is going, have you not read Ezekiel? 
Have you not read any of the prophets? Have you not read the Psalms, the Proverbs? Have you not read the Torah, the law? You know, all of those stories, all there, the puzzle pieces were there that points to this moment. Verse 11, very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the son of man. When Jesus said the son of man, Nicodemus knew exactly what he was saying. He was saying, I'm the son of man that Daniel saw in his vision when this one like the son of man approached the ancient of days and sat down at his right hand. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the son of man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Moses lifted up a bronze snake in the wilderness because the people of Israel had kept complaining and complaining and complaining. So God sent venomous snakes so they would stop complaining. I know that sounds harsh. And parents, that's not a good idea to get your kids to stop complaining. Do not go buy venomous snakes and just throw them on them. Okay? That, that will get you arrested. Okay? And you go to jail for that. That's bad. Don't do that. God did this because the people of Israel were just not trusting in God. They wanted to go their own way. And God was like, well, you're not listening. And so he told Moses, go make a snake, a bronze snake, and put it on a pole. And anybody who looks at that bronze snake will be saved. And so Jesus talking to Nicodemus is like, yeah, you remember Moses when he built the, made the bronze snake? Do you know what that was meant to point to? Me dying on the cross. Jesus had come to make the old new. And again, this was not a new idea. God had put those pieces in place. God was building to the crescendo. And that crescendo was realized when Jesus showed up. The new covenant that Jesus brought was rooted in the old covenant promises. Everything found in the Old Testament either points to or prepares us for the coming of the great Redeemer. The oldest book that scholars agree on, the oldest book found in Scripture is not Genesis. It's actually Job. Job is the oldest book as far as how far they can date it back to because Job actually takes place during the time of patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Genesis through Deuteronomy was written down by Moses. Before that, it was just told orally. Moses wrote down Genesis through Deuteronomy. But Job takes place during the time of the patriarchs. And even in Job, there is a verse there in chapter 19 of Job where Job says, I know that my Redeemer lives, and one day he will walk upon this earth. Even Job, the oldest book in the Old Testament, anticipates the great Redeemer. Going back to the Ezekiel passage in verse 38 that we read, God called redeemed humans, consecrated sheep, and this was a temple reference. When you, brought, when you brought your sacrifices to the temple, whatever you could afford, if you could afford a sheep, great. You'd bring that sheep and it had to be an unblemished sheep. It couldn't have any imperfections on it. it couldn't, you couldn't bring the sheep with the broken legs, okay? It's not like you walk up to the temple and say, yeah, yeah, this sheep's got like three broken legs. I'll just offer this, is that okay? You couldn't do that. You had to bring the perfect sheep. No blemishes, nothing wrong with them, nothing. Those sheep had to be a pleasing sacrifice to God. And the new covenant would make God's people perfect and without blemish. So what God was saying is like, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to make the sacrifice for you. Because when they bring the consecrated sheep, that means their sins were cleansed for a time. It was temporary. But God says, you guys are going to be consecrated sheep in the future forever. Because I'm going to give you a better sacrifice. I'm going to offer a better sacrifice for you. Michael Williams writes in his book, Far as the Curse is Found. What is new is that God is going to address the issue of Israel's inability to keep the covenant. God will cure the disease of sin. That was the whole point. The whole point of the law, the whole point of the Old Testament, all those stories was to point to God 
dealing with the problem of sin. God addressing our inability to keep the covenants. Because <clears throat> those Old Testament covenant, covenants and promises, they were just guardians. They were meant to keep us somewhat on that right path and to pave the way for Jesus to come. Because Paul even said what the law was powerless to do, God did by sending his son to be a sacrifice for our sins. So what is this new covenant? That's the second thing we're looking at this morning. What is this new covenant? In Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 33. Again, moving from Ezekiel to Jeremiah. Jeremiah, Jeremiah had a rough, rough life. Jeremiah was called at a young age to go tell the people of Israel how bad they were. Imagine being a teenager, because some people, scholars would think Jeremiah was around a teenager at that time. Imagine being a teenager, and God speaks to you in this vision and says, Hey, I set you apart in your mother's womb before you were even born, and this is what I want you to do. I want you to go tell my people just how bad they're being. Okay, do I have anybody else going with Nope. You're, you're going. Man, I, I'll go with you. But you're not, you're not taking anybody else with you. You're just going. That'd be a fun job, wouldn't it? It's always a fun job to be the bearer of bad news. It's like your boss telling you, okay, I need you to go fire these people. Awesome, thanks for that. <laughs> thanks for starting my Monday off right. Great. But Jeremiah <coughs> prophesied during a time of destruction. Jeremiah also wrote the book of Lamentations. We went through a whole series of Lamentations. Jeremiah wrote a book about lamenting. You know what lamenting is? It is a deep, deep, hurting, mourning anguish. And Jeremiah wrote a whole book about it. Because he's looking at the destruction of his homeland, his culture, everything. And lamenting over his people's sin. <clears throat> but in Jeremiah 31, starting in verse 31, this is what God speaks to the prophet again to the people of Israel in the midst of destruction and he says this the days are coming declares the Lord when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant though I was a husband to them declares the Lord this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Do you notice what God said to this prophet? In verse 33, God said under the new covenant, God's people will know him. So the question is how? How are we going to know it? Well, the answer is in verse 32. The new covenant would be written on people's hearts. It's not going to be like the one in Egypt. The one in Egypt is when Moses led the people to Mount Sinai and, got, and Moses goes up on the mountain and brings down stone tablets. It's like, I'm not going to do it that way again. I'm going to write the law on their hearts now. Well, how are you going to do that, God? Go back to Ezekiel. I'm going to take out their hearts of stone and give them a new heart hearts of flesh every person who is part of God's family will be inwardly informed of what God wants for them we will no longer need stone tablets to tell us what to do we'll have God himself to live inside of us to guide us so God was saying he was going to one day just right on the hearts of his people what the rules he wanted them to follow. Is that it? Is that the new covenant? He's just going to write these rules on our hearts and that's it? What God was saying through the prophet was that this new covenant was going to be way more personal. That's what he meant by it. This new covenant would not be written standards or rules. This covenant would be a person. When Jesus was walking one day, John the Baptist saw him. John the Baptist was his cousin. John the Baptist was brought up to prepare the way for the Lord, to be that voice in the wilderness. Interesting how the last book of the Old Testament we know of speaks of that voice in the wilderness. 
The last Old Testament prophet is Malachi, and the last things he says are there going to be a voice in the wilderness that will prepare the way for the Lord. And then you get to the New Testament, and John the Baptist shows up. But John the Baptist is technically the last of the Old Testament prophets. Because he looks like one, he acts like one, he speaks like one. <clears throat> he's out in the wilderness, and he's telling people to repent. And he's baptizing people, not for salvation. He's just getting them ready. And they come to him and they said, are you the Messiah? And he's like, of course not. I'm not even fit to untie that guy's sandals. I just baptized him with water in the Jordan River. But he'll baptize with the Spirit. And then he sees Jesus walking one day and he goes, look. Everybody stop what you're doing and look. There's the Lamb of God who's, who takes away the sins of the world. Lambs were brought to the temple to be sacrificed at Passover. Passover represents the time when the angel of death passed over the houses of the Israelites that had lamb's blood on their door frames. Jesus is a better Passover lamb because he gives himself so that we could be redeemed from slavery and death and so that those things would, be, would pass over us. When Jesus instituted that Lord's Supper that we call communion today, when he was extending that invitation, he was saying, I am the Passover lamb. I am the true Passover lamb. Here's my body given for you. Take and eat. And this is my bloodshed for you. Take and drink for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus was and is the new covenant. When God said that he would write the new covenant on our hearts, he was pointing to the one who had the very heart of God. This one was Jesus, and he had the heart of God because he was God. Paul himself writes about Jesus, says he is the image of the invisible God. All the promises of the Old Testament are fulfilled in Jesus. He's the better covenant. He's the better promise. The Last Supper was Jesus extending the invitation to embrace the new covenant, him. After he fed the 5,000, the crowd followed him. And he started talking with them. And he challenged them. He says, here's what you need to do. You need to eat my body and drink my blood. And they were just like, no, man, that got crazy. <laughs> that took a dark turn. <laughs> we're out. <laughs> we're not doing that. Jesus wasn't talking literally. He was saying, if you want this new life, if you want to stop searching everywhere else for things that are going to fulfill you, then stop right here and fully embrace me. When Jesus rode in Jerusalem, he was announcing that he was the king long promised to sit on David's throne, the great restorer of Israel. Unfortunately, people missed the point of his coming because they thought their enemy was Rome. And as they're waving their palm branches, you have your palm branches, as they were waving them, and they were laying them at his, at, at his feet or at the donkey's feet, and they were saying, Hosanna to the son of David. They were, what they were saying was, Hosanna, save us. And Hosanna was meant for only one person, and that is God. No one in Israel would ever go up to a normal person and say, Hosanna. They only said that to God. And so when Jesus is writing in, they knew exactly what he was announcing. He was publicly announcing, I am the long-awaited and anticipated son of David, the Messiah, the Savior, the Redeemer, and I'm coming to save you. And they were saying, yes, we agree. We accept that. Save us, we pray. Except they thought Jesus was going to save them from Rome. Because sometimes we think that Jesus has come to save us from our obstacles in life, our stresses, our annoyances. We think Jesus has come in just to make our life easier. And I'll be honest with you, giving your life to Jesus won't always make your life easier. It could make your life harder. Ask some people who in other countries where Christianity is not 
as accepted as it is here. They gave their life to Jesus and their life got a whole lot harder. <clears throat> but Jesus would come in to say, I am not here to save you from the inconveniences of this life. I'm not here to save you from governments that you may not agree with. I'm not here to save you from kings and rulers and leaders that you don't like. I came here to save you from sin and death. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 9, this is what God, this is what Paul writes about Jesus. He says this. Therefore, so when we read the word therefore, we have to see what comes before it. So let me read the verses before it. Verse 6. Who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage or something to be grasped. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. Verse 10, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Verse 11, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul was a guy who probably once thought that that Jesus guy was not the Messiah. He was supposed to ride in and save us from the Romans. And then when Paul encountered Jesus, Paul realized, yep, I was wrong. I thought Rome was our enemies. I neglected to realize that sin and death are our enemies. God never promised, and Jesus never promised, to save us from a hard life, an inconvenient life, an annoying life. God promised to save us from what was destroying us. Sin and death. That's why we, as Christians, when we approach that day, whenever that day comes, whether it's suddenly, whether it's we see it coming, when that day comes when this life is over, we don't need to fear. We can look death in the face and say, yeah, we believe in a Savior who already beat you. And because he beat you, he beat you for me too. And we can... See that as not an end, but a beginning. It's just a doorway to pass through where we can be with Jesus, our Savior, forever. So when Jesus was riding in, that's what he's declaring. That Palm Sunday, he was like, yeah, you guys are saying Hosanna. You guys are thinking I'm coming to, to beat up on Pontius Pilate and go take on Caesar. That's not it. I'm going to the cross. And that's what he's trying to tell Nicodemus. Just as the Son of Man was... Just as the bronze snake was lifted up in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. So that all who would look on him would be saved. Amen.